I have been summoned to take part in the invasion of Normandy. The airplane roared over our jeep, then nose down, made a steep turn over the Bay of the Mediterranean Sea, slumbering peacefully off the northern coast of Sicily. My driver frowned. Curious, I remarked. He must have been frightened by our identifying marks. But apparently it wasn't about them. The airplane turned ahead of us over the road again. It was a cub with protective brown colouring, similar to my air jeep. The airplane flew over us again, turned around and headed out to sea, shaking its wings. The pilot apparently double-eyed the shield with three red stars attached to the back of my jeep. I got up from the front seat and pointed forward. Let's go, I said to the driver. If he needed us, he'd land further down the road. Beyond Cape St. Angelo, the cliffs were behind us. Ahead stretched the wide coastline. An extraordinary silence reigned on the road. In the villages through which we passed, the empty window apertures in the brick walls smoked by the fires looked at us. Here and there were mangled hulks of German trucks shifted by our bulldozers to the roadside. The Germans, methodically retreating along the northern coast of Sicily, destroyed all the bridges. The rivers dried up and our sappers made passages through them by cutting the hard, steep banks. Our jeep ducked into one of these passages, keeping carefully between the white ribbons marking a section of the riverbed cleared of German teller anti-tank mines. I sat down again on a porous rubber seat taken from a German T4 tank in northern Tunisia. It was September 2, 1943. For three hours we drove leisurely along the road along the northern coast of Sicily to Messina. Lieutenant General Oliver Lees, commander of the British 30th Corps, had invited me to watch General Bernard Law Montgomery's troops cross the Strait of Messina the next morning. Lees and I had commanded two neighbouring corps during the Sicilian campaign, which had ended just two weeks before. Montgomery's first plan was for Lees's 30th Corps to follow the assaulting units enforcing the Strait. This rapid reinforcement of troops in the bridgehead would give Lieutenant General Miles Dempsey the opportunity to move more quickly with his British 13th Corps up the toe of the Italian boot. However, when Montgomery was forced to turn over some of his landing assets to Clark for the landing at Salerno, he had no choice but to cancel the 30th Corps crossing of the Strait. As a result, Lees found himself in the position of a spectator in the invasion of Italy. He chose as an observation point one of the heights south of Messina, from where we could follow the forcing of the strait with binoculars. As we rounded Cape St. Angelo, the cub disappeared. But when we got into the strait, I saw it on the ground not far from the shore. My adjutant, Captain Chester B. Hansen, was waiting for us, sitting on a stone fence beside the road. He jumped up and stopped the car. Mm, sorry to disturb you, General, he said, but we have just received a radiogram from 7th Army Headquarters. General Patton asks you to come to Palermo. I was disappointed that I would not be able to see the British crossing the strait, but I was sure it was a serious matter or Patton would never have brought me back. He knew that I was going to meet Oliver Lees at Messina. During the five-week campaign in Sicily, Lieutenant General George Patton commanded the newly formed 7th American Army, while Montgomery led the battle-hardened British 8th Army. In Patton's army, only my second corps, a veteran of the Tunisian campaign, had combat experience. My pilot, Captain Delbert Bristol, waited outside the airplane. The engine cowl bore the inscription, Mule No. Two of the Missouri, the battle-worn predecessor of this plane, had been decommissioned after honourable service in Tunisia. I climbed into the airplane, pulled the throttle handle, and applied the brake while Bristol turned the machine around. As we approached the bay in which the city of Palermo nestled, we flew over the second corps' command post, and by the time we landed, a jeep was waiting for us at the runway. We drove down a sandy road bulldozed through vineyards to the top of a hill, where the corps sent camp was located in a grove of olive trees. I immediately headed for the truck van made for me by the artillery technical workshop on the basis of a 2.5-ton truck. It housed not only my cramped apartment, but also my office. Inside the truck was decorated like a cabin on a small steamship. Equipment and furnishings for it were picked up in Oran and Algiers. What the requisitioners couldn't find, the artillery and technical service had done in their mobile repair shops. I turned the knob of the field telephone on the table and asked for General Patton. Madeley reporting, I said. What happened, sir? I don't know what the hell happened. Eisenhower sent a telegram for you to come to him early tomorrow morning. Where am I supposed to meet him? In Africa? No. 
He's coming to the Allied Forward Command post near Catania. You'll fly in my plane. It's better than the cub. Come have breakfast with me in the morning before you leave. I put the tube back in the leather case. It's no use asking, I said to Brigadier General William Keane, Chief of Staff of the Second Corps. George doesn't know any more than you or I do. Maybe Eisenhower is going to give us a new assignment. For the previous two weeks after the last German units crossed the Strait of Messina into Italy, our troops had been resting, receiving resupply, and getting their equipment and weapons in order. All of us, from the headquarters of Patton's 7th Army, housed in the palace in Palermo, to the last infantry company, camped in a bivouac on the southern coast of Sicily. Wondering where we would now be sent? To Italy or to England? Nowhere was this question discussed so lively as in the Second Corps. For eight months, more than 100,000 American soldiers and officers of the Corps passed with battles from the cold, wet mountains of Tunisia to the sun-scorched hills of Sicily. Although 22 months had elapsed since the attack on Pearl Harbor, our corps alone in the U.S. Army had gained combat experience in the war against the Germans. Headquarters developed two major naval landing operations, the first in North Africa near Oran, the second eight months later in Sicily. The staff were selected experienced officers. Nowhere knew it as well as in the corps itself. The question of the Second Corps' participation in the Italian campaign under Lieutenant General Mark Clark had not yet been decided, and so it was hoped that the Corps would be turned into an army and redeployed to England in preparation for the big invasion of France. As for Italy, the limited objectives of the Apennine Peninsula campaign did not appeal to us at all. Of course, it was not for us to decide where we should be sent, since the choice of strategic objectives depended on the commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force in the Mediterranean, General Dwight Eisenhower, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff. A corps is the lowest tactical unit that is created to coordinate the actions of two, three, four, and sometimes five divisions. A corps usually operates as part of a field army. An army may include up to four corps, like divisions. Corps are not permanent staff units of an army. Just as any division may be transferred from one corps to another, so any corps may be transferred with or without its divisions from one field army to another. During combat an army is a completely self-supporting unit with the innumerable supply and repair services that are necessary in modern warfare. Unlike an army, a corps is primarily a combat unit. It has a small rear tail. In addition to infantry and armoured divisions, a corps usually includes artillery, tank, mortar and fighter anti-tank divisions. Some of these corps units may be attached to divisions and report directly to the division commander. The others remain directly at the disposal of the corps commander and may be quickly concentrated on any section of the front. Et A.T. September 3 at 4 o'clock. 50 men. In the morning, we left the command post of the Second Corps and headed down the asphalt highway to Patton's headquarters at Palermo. George always got up early, especially in the field, and had breakfast at seven o'clock during a break in the fighting. Although we only had about 50 kilometers to travel, I tried to arrive on time. Patton's command post was guarded by a dozen light tanks, thoughtfully placed in a large square in front of the palace where he lived. The brocade-draped rooms of the large, gloomy palace smelled musty. There, in ancient luxury pattern, was destined to spend the most unhappy and agonizing days of his life. Forty-five minutes remained until breakfast. Leaving the jeep, we walked past shuttered storefronts down via Victor Emmanuel. Although Palermo had suffered little damage from air raids, the alleys were still not cleared of debris and rubble. Some soldiers of the air defense units, neatly dressed with ties and leggings, hurried to breakfast. All were aware of Patton's strict orders regarding the observance of uniforms. At precisely seven o'clock, Patton appeared for breakfast. His vivacity was invariably transmitted to those around him. He was witty, and his speech was a mixture of obscenity and healthy humour. He was both invigorating and overwhelming at the same time. George was a fine soldier. Unlike Eisenhower, George usually had breakfast in a small circle of his closest staff members and this time everyone was feeling chipper at the table, talking a lot. Patton grabbed my soldier holstered 11.43mm Colt, which I hadn't parted with in 30 years. Damn it, Brad, he said. You need a gun you can show up in public with. You can't carry that gun around everywhere. He showed me his small 8.13mm pistol, carried in a shoulder holster, and promised to send me one. After breakfast, Patton rode with me to the airfield in his huge closed Packard, 
adorned with two sharp-sounding chrome signals. We stopped in front of a shabby C-47 cargo plane that the Transportation Aviation Command had provided packed. The pilot brought in two upholstered reclining chairs and bolted them with wire to rings in the floor to secure the cargo. Nice. Hmm. Patton pointed at them. Where the hell did he steal them? The forward command post of the Allied headquarters, where I was to meet with Eisenhower, hardly deserves such a loud name, at the airfield in Catania. We were met by Ike's adjutant and escorted to a haphazardly scattered group of small tents hidden behind a few olive trees in the shade of Mount Etna. Eisenhower had flown in from North Africa that morning to be present when representatives of the Badoglio government signed the preliminary terms of surrender. Eisenhower conferred in a tent with his commanders who had also arrived by airplane. Standing outside the tent were Eisenhower's chief of staff. Major General Walter Bedell Smith and Army Group Commander General Harold Alexander. Smith looked grim and tired after the tedious weeks-long negotiations before the surrender of Italy, but both were very pleased that they had managed to finalize the negotiations before Clark's troops landed in the Salerno area. Just then, Clark's troops were loading onto ships in North Africa to land in the early morning hours of September 9. In mid-July, the Joint Chiefs of Staff abandoned their previous limited plans to bombard Italy from the air in favour of a direct strike on Naples and a broad offensive northward along the Apennine Peninsula. For this purpose, at the disposal of Eisenhower was an additional 66,000 troops, which were originally intended to be sent to England. A new British proposal to provide Eisenhower another 50,000 men was rejected by the American Chiefs of Staff, General George C., Marshall, interested in not weakening even more concentrated in England allied forces, insisted on reducing the contingents of troops sent to Italy to a minimum, indicating that the success of the landing in Naples should be ensured by decisive action. July 26. The British withdrew their proposal, and at the disposal of Eisenhower were left insignificant forces, with which he was to carry out the landing in Salerno. German High Command, counting on the fact that the Italian people still retained some fighting spirit, planned in early July to strengthen the German troops in Italy a few more divisions. We did not foresee this. Believing that the Germans will be limited to the protection of the plains of northern Italy, where there was a network of airfields from which you can make raids on German industrial centres, the chief of the British Imperial General Staff, General Alan Brooke, estimated the number of German forces in all of Italy on August 14 at five divisions. However, he at the same time told the Joint Chiefs of Staff Committee that there were signs of new reinforcements arriving. Brooke, as well as most officers in the Allied planning authorities, believed that the Germans would not risk sending troops into the vulnerable bottom of the Italian boot. By August 24, General Eisenhower's staff believed that the number of German divisions in Italy had increased to 16. Still, optimists believed that in the event of an Allied offensive, the Germans would withdraw to the Po River frontier without resistance. Once our intentions to land north of the area of crossing Montgomery's troops were unravelled by the Germans, it was not difficult for them to realise that we would need to capture Naples to use it as a supply base to support this operation. The enemy also realised that if the landing in the Naples area was successful, we will be able to capture airfields in Foggia, located on the other side of the Apennine Peninsula on the Adriatic Sea, operating from these airfields. Our heavy bombers will be able to reach South Germany, Austria and strategically important oil production areas in Plalesti. That is why the Germans were anxious to do everything possible to prevent us from gaining possession of these airfields. General Bedell Smith told me that the announcement of Italy's surrender would be issued on the evening of September 8, so that the Italians would have time to lay down their arms before Clark's troops landed. He hoped that such an announcement at the very last moment would delay the transfer of German reinforcements to the coast south of Naples, and that the Allies would be able to land without interference. Eisenhower and Badoglio were to simultaneously report the surrender of Italy by radio from Algiers and Rome. Alexander was in high spirits on the occasion of the report received in the morning that Montgomery's troops had crossed the Straits of Messina without encountering resistance. He had spent much of the evening before negotiating the surrender with General Castellano, Marshal Pietro Badoglio's representative from Rome. Faced with the danger of an Allied invasion and under German occupation, the Italians were keenly interested in salvaging what they could by going over to the Allied side. Eisenhower came out of the small tent and saw me with Smith and Alexander. He came up to us with a big smile on his face. Ma, 
Brad, good to see you. Have you been waiting long? He took me under his arm and led me into the tent, which was empty except for a long wooden dining table that stood on the dirt floor. On the table were several tin cans half filled with cigarette butts. I have good news for you, Brad. You've got an interesting new assignment. I tried to hide my excitement. We've received orders for you to go to England and take command of an army to prepare for the invasion of France. Just five months before, I had received a corpse now becoming commander of the army. After 28 years of peacetime promotion at a snail's pace, I now had no time to buy General's stars. At the end of the Tunisia campaign, I became the only U.S. Army Corps commander with experience in the war against the Germans. In Sicily, I was involved in conducting a major amphibious operation. The combat experience I gained was invaluable in the invasion of France. When should I leave? I asked. As soon as you get ready. General Marshall is in a hurry. Apparently, Jackie had pressed him to appoint an army commander now. The Jackie that Eisenhower was referring to was none other than Lieutenant General Jacob Devereux, commander of troops in the European theatre. For the past few months, he had been concerned that the British not overtake the American command in planning the invasion. Devers's concerns had some basis, in fact. In January 1943 at Casablanca, President Roosevelt had originally proposed that an Englishman be appointed as supreme commander to plan and direct the invasion of France. He then envisioned that the invasion would take place in 1943 and involve mainly British troops. Churchill, however, at Casablanca made a proposal at Casablanca to confine himself to planning the operation and to postpone the question of appointing a commander. Although Churchill agreed that the commander should be an Englishman, he reaffirmed his adherence to the principle that to lead operations, as a rule, the general of the country that put more troops. The Joint Chiefs of Staff sharing Churchill's view was only in favour of approving a candidate for the post of Chief of Staff to the yet-to-be-appointed Supreme Commander. Such a Chief of Staff from the British was to direct the initial planning of the operation until a commander was appointed. Shortly thereafter, the British outlined Lieutenant General Frederick Morgan as their top staff officer for the newly created headquarters. The Americans protested this uncoordinated decision by the British. Finally, after a month of wrangling, both sides agreed to create a joint staff headed by Morgan as Chief of Staff to the Supreme Allied Commander. The headquarters was abbreviated Cossack after the first letters of Morgan's new job title. Hopes that a Supreme Commander would soon be appointed collapsed with the possibility of an invasion in 1943. When the invasion was postponed until 1944, it became clear that because of the large concentration of American troops in England, an American would be appointed as Supreme Commander. Cossack's first task was not to devise an invasion plan, but to see if, with the resources the Allies were counting on in 1944, an invasion of the Channel Coast could be undertaken. In other words, Cossack began its work by ascertaining the feasibility of an invasion. During this period, the commander of the forces in the European theatre was to play the role of the American watchdog, overseeing Cossack's joint planning and it was he who was to be consulted on the joint use of the American Army, Navy and Air Force. As soon as Cossack began planning, the British hurriedly formed their field armies, naval and air force formations dedicated to participation in the invasion. By July 1943, the British 2nd Army, 1st Canadian Army and 21st Army Group had been formed, with their headquarters in London. There was no corresponding American field headquarters in England, and so for ground troops, Morgan's headquarters looked to the 21st Army Group headquarters for guidance. In effect, until the arrival of the 1st American Army in England in October 1943. The only American tactical unit in that country was Major General Leonard Jarrow's 5th Corps. In May 1943, Deverue urged the U.S. War Department to establish an American Army headquarters in England similar to those of the British and Canadian armies. The War Department, however, hesitated. In July, De Vere insisted on the creation of an American army group similar to the 21st British group. Again, the War Department took a wait-and-see attitude. Finally, on August 25, General Marshall radioed Eisenhower in Algiers. Devers and General Morgan have been pressing us since the beginning of July to immediately appoint a commander of the American army on the model of the commanders of the British armies, who are now busily engaged in manning and equipping their troops. I have nominated Bradley. Can't you release Bradley for the post? 
Eisenhower was not slow to reply and on August 27 reported. Your telegram transmitted by teletype coincided in time with my letter, which I have just sent regarding the higher officers in this theatre of operations. Personally, the thought of having to part with Bradley saddens me. He has greatly facilitated my work, which otherwise would have fallen entirely on my shoulders. It was so in the past when he was only a corps commander, but it is this circumstance that seems to have determined that your choice fell upon him. On September 2, the same day that Eisenhower radioed Patton about me, and I was on my way to Messina, the Allied headquarters in Algiers received a telegram from the War Department. The telegram was from General Marsh. Thank you for your generosity in the matter of Bradley. Order him to prepare to leave for England. The official order will be radioed later. I think you'll want to keep his corpse headquarters. If you can, find out from Bradley which of his officers he wants to take to England. Tell him that he will be in charge of army headquarters, and he may also have to set up an army group headquarters to keep up with the British. General Marshall's proposal to take from the headquarters of the Second Corps of the most valuable workers for my new army headquarters was just what I dreamed of. In conveying this proposal, Ike treated me more generously than I had expected. Hmm. Take anyone you want with you, he said. You'll need the best staff you can get. Later, when I made the list, my successor as commander of the Second Corps, Major General John Lucas, looked it over and howled. But this will give you the opportunity, I assured him, to assign your employees to the vacated positions. Lucas frowned. Hmm. Quid pro quo, I said. I'll give you the box truck, along with the jeep and the sponge rubber seats. Hell, you can't take them with you anyway, Lucas said, tapping me on the shoulder. Badly, you're asking a lot, but if I were you, I'd do the same thing. I might have been wrong to deprive the Second Corps headquarters of many of its best officers, but I couldn't go so far as not to take them with me and entrust the organization of the invasion across the channel to inexperienced staff officers. There was too much at stake with this invasion. Lucas understood that as well as I did. No matter how knowledgeable an officer was or how well trained he was, he would not be a full-time employee until he had gained combat experience, especially since planning an amphibious operation was a very complicated affair requiring a lot of hard work. We would be remiss if we did not involve the most experienced workers in the planning. A few months later, when Eisenhower was appointed Supreme Allied Commander, he faced a similar problem. Like me, he took with him to England a large part of his staff from the Mediterranean Theatre of Operations. General Marshall, ordering me to create the headquarters of the group of armies and simultaneously command, the army doubly complicated my task. Although the final decision on the appointment of the commander of the group of armies has not yet been made, I had to lead both the group and the army for a full nine months, that is, until the invasion of Normandy. The meeting with Ike ended with an invitation to breakfast. There will be no damn Vienna sausages at breakfast with which you always feed me here, you said like. That same day, before returning from Palermo to Corps headquarters, I stayed a short time with Patton and reported the order I had received. I told him that I should arrive in England the following Sunday. Patton immediately offered his C-47 to fly to Algeria. In the evening, Keane sat with me well past midnight. We went through the lists of Corps personnel and selected the right people. Only by 1.00 a.m. was the final list ready, which left 30 men after the reduction. Keane put a cigarette in the mouthpiece, looked at me across the table and smiled. I understood his thought and said, What a terrible responsibility it is for you and me to organise the biggest invasion. Keane nodded his head and looked at the map of Europe on the wall. But, Bill, I added frankly, who in the army has more experience than you and me? Seven months ago, that would have been a brazen boast because then Keane and I were in Florida storming with the 28th Division, a half-submerged section known as Dog Island. In Florida, you can see all the seasons in winter. The coldest weather is on the Apalachicola Gulf Coast. Apalachicola, despite its sonorous Native American name, is a rundown crossroads town just west of the grim Gordon Johnson Army Camp. 80 kilometers down the highway to the north is the central point of the area, the pleasant town of Tallahassee. There, however, one could spend time there only on Sundays. Here on the sullen, damp coast of the Florida Peninsula during the winter of early 1943, the 28th Division was training for the invasion. Early the previous fall, 
The Airborne Training Command had moved its school from the Cape Cod Peninsula to Florida so that all weather training and landing operations could be conducted. The site for Camp Gordon Johnson was cleared on a deserted coastline amidst scrub brush. Not far out to sea, a chain of reefs sheltered from the sea wave the shore on which our soldiers were practicing. Day after day, they jumped from blunt-nosed landing craft into the water during training attacks on the enemy coast of Dog Island. These training exercises presented the division headquarters with new and difficult problems of tactics and material support for the troops. Although I had previously studied the tactics of landing troops in military schools, this was the first time I had to conduct practical exercises involving troops and landing craft. Most of the landing craft we used were built after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. The 28th Division, part of the Pennsylvania National Guard, was the second division under my command. I first commanded the 82nd Infantry Division, the forerunner of the famous Airborne Division. I was appointed commander of the 82nd Division quite unexpectedly, as I was one of the youngest brigadier generals in the Army at the time. In September 1941, General Marshall visited the infantry school at Fort Benning, of which I had already been chief for six months. As we walked through the military compound to my apartment where breakfast was prepared, Marshall turned to me and asked, Bradley, is there a suitable man in mind to replace you when you take command of the division? Not yet, sir, I replied, trying to hide my astonishment. But if I had Levin Allen, whom I asked for, he would be a suitable man. A few months before, an order had been issued appointing Lieutenant Colonel Levin Allen as my aide-de-camp at Fort Benning. However, Brigadier General Jero, the Chief of Military Planning in Washington, who was in charge of officer utilization, rescinded the order. The issue was not raised again until three months later. A few days before Christmas in 1941, I received a call from an old friend of mine from infantry school days, Lieutenant Colonel George Van W. Topp, who had served in the personnel office in Washington. Omar, he said, we are forming three new divisions, and you will command one of them. It's the 82nd Division. Let us know as soon as possible who you want to take to your headquarters. I will try to ensure the appointment of these people. That same day, I called Pop. All the officers suitable for the post of Chief of Staff, I said, seem to hold important posts. Take you, for instance. I don't think you can break free. Get out of here, shouted Pop. Damn it, that's all I want. I'll make inquiries right away and let you know immediately. In the meantime, reserve a seat for me. I had known Pop for years as a humble and well-trained soldier. He was at one time an instructor in the armament department at Fort Benning, and I considered him one of our most well-trained officers. Now he held a key position in personnel management in Washington and could help me select the right staff. A few minutes later, he called me. Hmm, Omar, he said. You now have a chief of staff. Pop had a hard time plucking great officers, and the 82nd Division was in a favorable position from the start. By March 1942, troop echelons began arriving at the access roads of Camp Clybourne, located in the state of Louisiana, near the fast-growing city of Alexandria on the banks of the muddy Red River. Trains brought recruits directly from recruiting stations. As a rule, the first few weeks in the army have a depressing effect on the soldier. He gets homesick, we knew that the recruits, upon arrival at Camp Claiborne, would likely be overwhelmed by the depersonalization that turns a man into a soldier. So we decided to assign them, even before they arrived at camp, to units they could call home. Officers and sergeants sat down with the recruits at the embarkation points and grouped them on trains according to their future assignments. Washington learned of our practice of assigning men to units en route, and it later became routine procedure. When troop echelons arrived at Claiborne, we greeted them with a brass band. Officers and NCOs organized the arrivals into companies and batteries and took them to their barracks. Clean beds awaited them there, and a hot lunch was ready in the mess hall. Laundries quickly put in order soiled and wrinkled on the road uniforms. Each soldier received a standardized armband with his division number. On the other side of Alexandria, across the Red River, was the 28th Division which was experiencing the difficulties that many National Guard divisions faced during mobilization. Like other divisions called up for federal service in 1940 and 1941, the 28th Division repeatedly transferred some of its cadre to form new divisions. More to the point, hundreds of the division's best non-commissioned officers were sent to officer schools, and the best soldiers were transferred to aviation to attend flight schools. 
From time to time the division was replenished with conscripts and thus was never combat effective. In June 1942, I received orders to surrender the 82nd Division and take command of the 28th Division. I was to make a combat-ready division out of disparate units. However, for several more months from the 28th Division continued to take cadre soldiers and select candidates for officer schools. The constant turnover of personnel disrupted our training, and all units and subunits of the division were in dire need of junior officers and sergeants. Companies were often commanded by second lieutenants assisted by sergeants. Finally, when the 4th Corps once again demanded men to man the new division, All right, we'll give you those men, but I think that in return you will send us trained cadres so that we can work as well. At the same time, a new problem arose in the 28th Division. Some companies had groups of soldiers from the same area. When a sergeant vacancy opened up in such a company, the sergeant's stripes were usually given to one of the countrymen. Moreover, the officers and soldiers in such companies knew each other before the army, which made it difficult to maintain discipline. Senior officers deplored the system of protectionism that had developed, but they seemed powerless to put an end to it. I came to the conclusion that as long as we tolerated these manifestations of compatriotism, we would not have a division. To rectify the situation I resorted to a harsh measure. By one order all officers and almost all sergeants were transferred from the companies where their fellow countrymen served to other units. By the end of the summer there were fewer cases of personnel transfers from division to division, and shortly before going on manoeuvres in the fall of 1942, we were completed with young lieutenants who had graduated from officer candidate schools. The 28th Division was injected with a fresh stream, and soon it became a fully trained and organised unit. During an inspection trip to the manoeuvre area that fall, Lieutenant General Leslie J. McNair, commander of the Army Ground Forces, hinted that I might soon have to command a corps. General Marshall, however, he said, wants to make sure you have the 28th Division in hand before agreeing to a promotion. Don't forget that General Simpson had to chip in two divisions before he got the corps. The manoeuvres showed that the 28th Division could move to increased training. In December came orders to move the division to Camp Gordon Johnson. I was now under martial law and had packed my personal belongings in two valises. In addition, I had a bedroll. Most of my household furnishings had been packed and sent by baggage to my home in Missouri and the rest of my wife had stowed the rest in two travelling trunks. I knew that garrison life was over, that we could no longer afford the luxury of enjoying the comforts of home. On February 12, 1943, I celebrated my birthday at Camp Gordon Johnson. It was my 50th birthday. By this time, newspaper reports of the winter campaign in Tunisia made it clear that our days in the United States were coming to an end. At noon, I received a telegram by teletype from General Marshall. It is quite fitting that you celebrated your birthday a few days before your appointment as Corp Commander. This appointment belatedly recognises your fine accomplishments in training the 28th Division. I congratulate you and send my best wishes. The telegram arrived on Friday. I decided that the assignment order would arrive at the earliest on Tuesday morning. Along with going to the field that day, I stayed late at the Division headquarters. Shortly after 10 o'clock I got a phone call from Washington. It was Major General Alexander Bowling, Chief of Personnel at McNair's headquarters. Orders are being issued today concerning you, Bradley. You're going on an extended deployment overseas. Overseas. I asked, recalling that General Marshall was referring to a corps in the United States. Apparently something has changed since his telegram of three days ago. I thought, where am I going? I asked Bowling, referring to Africa or the Pacific, and hoping it was Africa. Bowling paused. Remember your classmate, he said. You will be with him. I can't say more than that over the phone. I realized he was referring to Africa. Eisenhower and I graduated together from West Point Military School in 1915. When can you leave? No, tomorrow, I replied. I have everything ready. No, good, he said. We will immediately order a priority airlift from Tallahassee to Washington. Call me at 11 o'clock. I rushed over the wooden bridges to my room at the end of the adjoining barracks. The orderly was cleaning the mud off my field boots. You better get my stuff, I told him. Everything, everything. When I get back, I'll help you. My chief of staff, Bill Keane, who had replaced Pop, who had been promoted, was waiting in the office. Just received a teletype cipher regarding you, he reported.
They'll have it decoded in about twenty minutes. I told him about Bowling's call. Well, anything can happen these days, said the astonished Keen. Twenty minutes later, Keen returned. We've deciphered the telegram, General. You are ordered to arrive at Sherman, Texas. There you will receive the Tenth Corps. I was as surprised as he was. At Ilunzin Zero, I called Bowling in Washington. Alex, I'm confused. What do you know about my appointment as commander of the Tenth Corps? Hmm, forget it, he replied. That was yesterday. Today you're going overseas. I asked Bowling if I would have some sort of command authority. Um, if you are thinking of a headquarters, he said, we give you only two adjutants. Obviously it was not a governing body. Both of my adjutants, Bridge and Hansen, had joined the army as privates in 1941 and had graduated together from Infantry Officer Candidate School in April, 1943, with excellent performance. That morning they were in the field on a troop drill. Bridge was practicing with the infantry company and Hansen was practicing with the scouts. I sent a messenger after them. They quickly showed up at the division command post, Bridge covered in mud and Hansen wet to the waist after a training landing on Dog Island. How would you feel about greasing your heels with lard? I asked them. They promised to pack up in twenty minutes. We left the camp at two p.m., thirty min, the same day. The order was secret, and I did not venture to inform even my travelling companions that we were going overseas. At Washington I reported directly to General Marshall. Since I had left the War Department in 1941, it had moved from the outdated, unsightly munitions building on Constitution Avenue to the new Pentagon building across the Potomac River. It took the Chief of Staff only ten minutes to outline my assignment. As to the situation in Africa, I was to obtain all information on the subject myself from the Operations Office in the Pentagon, Eisenhower as Commander-in-Chief of the Allied Forces in the Mediterranean Theatre of Operations, led troops stretching almost 2,000 kilometres from Casablanca on the Atlantic coast of Africa to the front in Tunisia. The French colonies in North Africa, hitherto loyal to the Vichy government and unaffected by the war because they were separated from France by the Mediterranean Sea, were now thrown into political chaos by the Allied invasion. Vichy intrigues, unrest among the Arabs, and French hostility to the British all presented the Allies with a number of thorny issues that could cause complications. In this political chaos, Eisenhower was a liberator to some and an invader to others. He was expected to be not only the chief Allied diplomat, but also a strategist, administrator, and commander of Allied forces. This was already enough. But on top of that, Eisenhower as Allied commander had to serve two flags at once, American and British, and to devote himself entirely to now directing the combined operations to win the war. Such a post required impartiality and discretion to overcome a sense of national commitment. Understandably, no matter how significant the common interests in the war, it was extremely difficult for the Allies to fuse their forces, suppress national rivalries and pride by subjecting themselves to the authority of a single Allied commander. Eisenhower was determined to make the Allied command effective and he did not stop short of using harsh measures against those who tried to cover their defiance by invoking the flag of their country. Eisenhower's command post in Algeria was located about 650 kilometers from the Allied forces on the Tunisian front. From this remote command post, he tried to direct the troops of the three nations, troops that were scattered along the coast. Eisenhower realized the dangers inherent in directing combat operations so far away from the troops, so he planned to appoint Alexander as his deputy, giving him the responsibility of leading the Allied ground forces. However, this was not done until after Montgomery's Eighth Army. Part of the Middle East Command, led by Alexander, crossed the border between Tripolitania and Tunisia near the Merit Line. Meanwhile, General Marshall, who was overseeing the training of an ever-increasing army in the United States, was interested in learning more about the fighting qualities of American officers and troops and the effectiveness of American armaments. To help Eisenhower gather such information, he offered to place an American officer at his disposal to become Ike's eyes and ears among the American troops on the Tunisian front. It's on the same day, February 12, when Marshall wished me a happy birthday by radio at Camp Gordon Johnson, Eisenhower sent him the following telegram by Telety. I have looked over the list of generals to find a suitable candidate capable of being my eyes and ears, as you suggested. I believe that all the generals who could do the job well are already in very important positions, 
such as division commanders. It occurred to me that the division commanders now being formed in the United States could gain extremely valuable experience by alternately being in this theater of operations for, say, three months. The nature of the work to be done here requires not so much detailed knowledge of the theater of war as intelligence, tact, and acumen, so that an able man could successfully begin work after a week's stay in the theater. If such a suggestion is suitable in principle, then I can point out a number of generals who are highly acceptable to me. They are Major Generals Hester, Terrell, Bradley, Brash, Bohr, Gerhardt, Ridgeway, Ransom, Collette, Vargan, Pritchard and Livesey. But the retired officers, General Gasser, could do the work well. If you do not agree with my suggestion, then please give me a list of those persons whom you think can be sent to perform such a task for a short or long period. Marshall had me on hand as a result of my assignment to the 10th Corps, which I think explains to some extent why he chose me from among the generals on Eisenhower's list. So after 32 years in the army, I went to war for the first time. End Tito. My long acquaintance with General Marshall began in 1929, when I introduced myself to him as a tactics instructor at the infantry school at Fort Benning. I was then a major. In June of that year, I graduated from the command and general staff school at Fort Leavenworth. When World War I ended, I never got to be overseas. I feared my military career would be blighted from the start. Like Eisenhower, I was stationed in the United States for the entire First World War, while my fellow students distinguished themselves at the front. I commanded a company guarding the copper mines in Bert. In 1924, I was sent to Fort Benning for advanced training at the infantry school. Here I had to compete with many officers my age who already had combat experience. However, in solving tactical problems, I made sure that my judgment was not impaired by the fact that I had not had to be in the war. When I graduated second in my class, I regained confidence in my abilities and never lost heart again. Upon graduation from the command and general staff school, I was appointed to teach small unit tactics up to, and including battalion in the infantry school department, and a year later I was appointed chief of the armament cycle. General Marshall was then a lieutenant colonel and held the position of deputy chief of the school. Having appointed an officer to a position, he seldom interfered with his functions. During the two years of my service under him as cycle chief, he called on me only once to discuss the work. During the same time, Marshall only visited my cycle twice. From General Marshall, I learned the proper way to build relationships with my subordinate officers. Throughout the war, I avoided interfering with the functions of my subordinates. If an officer lived up to expectations, I gave him complete freedom of action. If he showed uncertainty, I tried to help him. If he failed in his duties, I relieved him of his position. In 1936, Marshall was promoted to Brigadier General. I was then stationed at West Point, from where I sent him a congratulatory telegram. General Marshall replied with a short but prophetic letter. I sincerely hope that we shall again have an opportunity to serve together. It will be a great pleasure to me. That opportunity came in 1940, when General Marshall, having become Chief of the General Staff, transferred me from the War Department personnel office to his office as, as Assistant Secretary of the General Staff. I was to make oral reports on documents on which the Chief of General Staff had to make a decision. A week later, General Marshall called me and the other assistants into his office and said, Gentlemen, I am not satisfied with you. Up to now you have never once contradicted me. General, I replied, that is only because there has been no cause for disagreement. When we disagree with you, we will tell you so. By this time I had known General Marshall for more than ten years, but I never felt at ease in his presence. I prepared carefully for every report. Marshall instantly grasped the essence of the most convoluted staff document and cross-examined his assistant secretaries before making a decision. If a report was not fully thought out, he would immediately notice and ask why it had not been done sooner. In every document General Marshall tried to find not facts to support his point of view, but an opposing view. When you come here with your report, he said to me, I ask you to state all considerations on which I might disagree with the project proposed to me. If, in spite of your objections, my decision will still seem more reasonable, then I am right. In November 1940, Brigadier General Robert Ekelberger, the chief of West Point, asked me to become his deputy in charge of combat operations. After two years of service in the War Department, I had grown weary of staff work and was anxious to return to a command position. I was too young, however, to hope for a regular regimental commander's position. On his next visit to Washington, 
Eichelberger spoke to General Marshall about me. As he left the office of the Chief of Staff, he stopped at my desk. Congratulations, Omar, you have been appointed, he said. General Marshall had just agreed to honor my request. A week later, as I was leaving his office, Marshall stopped me, asking, Do you really want to be assigned to West Point as deputy in charge of combat operations? Yes, sir, I replied. It is a command position and I will have the opportunity to participate in officer training. I spent 12 years at West Point, four of them as a cadet, and I believe I am well acquainted with the conditions at the school. I failed to convince General Marshall. He turned to the window overlooking Constitution Avenue. I am thinking of transferring Hodges here from Fort Benning, he said, and making him Chief of Infantry. Would you like to go in his place? I caught my breath. Brigadier General Courtney Hodges was Chief of the Infantry School, which was one of the most enviable positions in the military. Yes, sir, I replied. It makes a complete difference. Very well, Bradley, said Marshall, his mind already made up. As soon as I can get Hodges transferred to Washington, you'll go there. Three months later, in February 1941, when I was in General Marshall's office, he said, get the Deputy Chief of Staff, Bradley, and come back with him. I came back with the Deputy, and General Marshall gave the order for me to be appointed Chief of Infantry School. In February 20, a proposal for my promotion was sent to Congress for approval. The next day I left for Fort Benning. A telegram awaited me there. The Senate had approved my promotion from Lieutenant Colonel to Brigadier General. Etcher T. Having finished explaining my duties to Eisenhower, General Marshall instructed me to deliver two letters to Algiers. They were marked top secret and contained instructions to Eisenhower to invade Sicily. Marshall ordered me to read both letters and be prepared to destroy them in the event of a forced landing en route. The Joint Chiefs of Staff had set the invasion of Sicily for July 10, a mere five months later. General Marshall, however, had no doubt that Eisenhower will be able to clear from the enemy in time to clear North Africa to regroup his troops and organize a landing in Sicily. In those days, Field Marshal Erwin Rommel under Montgomery's blows quickly retreated across the Libyan desert to the Marit Line. Although Eisenhower's allied forces were extremely stretched on the front in Tunisia, it was clear that the advantages in terms of rear area work and therefore the accumulation of forces were on the side of the Allies. Allied air power, for the time being confined to North African airfields, which had become swamps due to the rains, continued to grow in numbers as the increasing production of aircraft in the United States enabled Eisenhower to replace obsolete P-40s with new P-38s. General Marshall thought in strategic terms, and for him, who was already planning an invasion across the Channel, the importance of the war in North Africa was reduced to a battle for time. If the Germans, throwing reinforcements from Italy, sought to delay the war, the Allies overstretched their forces in an attempt to end the war in Africa in time for the invasion of Sicily. On the morning of the day I arrived in Washington, it seemed that the Germans had succeeded in stopping the hand of the clock. Reporting to the brightly lit operations room in the Pentagon, I saw a flood of radiograms from Algeria with reports that the Allies had failed at the Fade Passage. The battle that became known as the Battle of Kasserine Pass had begun. Here the Germans inflicted their first defeat on us. This was preceded by the following events. During the landing in Africa, the capture of such an important object, such as Tunisia, justified the great risk of the Allies. If Eisenhower had managed to occupy this major port, then the supply lines of Rommel's African Corps, fighting far away in Tripolitania, would have been interrupted. Tunisia lies almost in the center of the Mediterranean. Axis troops in Sicily reliably covered Tunisia, and therefore it was not included as a target during Operation Torch, which provided for the landing of paratroops in the area of Casablanca, Oran, and Algiers. German aircraft launched strikes from Sardinia and Sicily against caravans of Allied ships passing through the narrow passage between Sicily and Tunisia. This aviation in Malta, subjected to fierce bombardment of the Germans, was too busy defending the island and could not provide air cover for the Allied landing in the Tunis area. More the Allied resources were used to the limit to ensure the landing of very dispersed landing forces during Operation Torch. The resources on hand made it impossible to organize a landing of troops in a fourth location. Eisenhower rushed to Tunisia almost immediately after the landing on November 8, 1942. As soon as an infantry division had been formed from scattered Allied troops, 
and about a regiment of tanks have been assembled. Tunisia was 900 kilometers by road from the easternmost point where the Allied troops landed near Algiers. Mike made a bold gamble in the days when only boldness could bring results. Mike lost. He lost, although the goal was already in front of his eyes, because the winter rains unprecedented for Tunisia and the columns of troops stuck in the mud. Meanwhile, if in early November 1942, the Germans had 5,000 people in Tunisia, then by the end of the month, the number of their troops tripled due to airplane-dropped reinforcements. By the end of December, Eisenhower's hopes for a quick conclusion to the campaign in North Africa dissipated like smoke. The Allies began to stabilize their front on the cold hills of Tunisia. To organize a new offensive, Eisenhower needed to concentrate large forces. On January 1, Eisenhower appointed Major General Lloyd Fredendall as commander of the 2nd Corps and ordered him to concentrate his troops on the southern section of the Tunisian front for an offensive towards Fax. Initially, the 2nd Corps was to consist of the 1st Armoured Division and infantry units. The Corps was to concentrate behind infantry cover scattered along the east dorsal mountain range stretching from north to south. After the 2nd Corps took its positions, the Allied troops stretched along a broad front stretching over 400 kilometers. It stretched from the thickets of the Sejanan River Valley, near the Mediterranean Sea in the north to the edge of the vegetation-deprived Sahara Desert in the south. By January, the front was divided into three separate sectors, each occupied by troops of the respective country under its national flag. In the north were British troops under the command of Lieutenant General Kenneth Anderson, commander of the British First Army. They held positions in the mountains surrounding the port cities of Bizerte and Tunis. In the centre, motley French battalions occupied a front of more than 160 kilometres along the east dorsal, including the passes near Picon and Fade. In the south, the American Second Corps was covering the Allied right flank and stockpiling supplies at Tibesa. Although the enemy was now pinned down on the coast of Tunisia, the Axis powers commanders continued to pour in troops and armaments in an effort to prolong the war in Africa. Huge, quiet German transport planes landed in a steady stream on concrete paved airfields near Tunis, while Allied aircraft were hopelessly stuck in the mud at airfields in Algeria and Tunisia. By mid-January, Eisenhower, having learned in Casablanca that Montgomery would not reach the Marat line in time to begin joint action with the Second Corps, abandoned the plan for an offensive from Tibesa to Sfax. Eisenhower decided to concentrate sufficient forces and postponed the offensive until the spring. Commander of the Axis forces in Tunisia. General Arnim realized that to compete with the Allies in the accumulation of forces, a hopeless cause as German losses in Russia deprived the Germans of reserves. In early January, the enemy began to probe the positions of Eisenhower on the boundary of the East Dorsal. By the end of January, Enemy attacks seriously weakened the position of the Allies on this line. Each new breakthrough positions entailed a transfer of troops to prevent the development of success of the Germans. Reserves, which Eisenhower had counted on to counter the enemy offensive, quickly depleted. The front began to waver under the continuous blows of troops and Eme, and Eisenhower came to the conclusion that the growing danger forces him to subordinate the French to the British command. Despite their objections in late January, he tried to rectify the situation, ordering the unification of the Allied front under the command of Anderson. On January 30, the Germans attacked French troops, this time at the Fade Pass. Although the French gained a foothold on the road beyond the pass, a gap was made in the Allied front, giving the Germans access through East Dorsal to Allied communications. By February, Eisenhower held an unstable and severely weakened front all along the Dorsal. The situation was further complicated when Rommel retreated from Tripolitania to the Maret Line. His army now linked up with Arnim's forces, and they created a solid front in Tunisia to fight a prolonged defensive war. In early February, Allied intelligence reported the possibility of a strong German offensive in the direction of Fonduc, with German troops coming to the rear of Anderson's 1st British Army. The enemy could strike at other parts of the front, but the Allied command decided that Fondok will be the main object of the German offensive. This almost led to disastrous consequences. Eisenhower decided to personally make sure that the front is held firmly. To this end, he left Algiers at midnight on February 12 at the headquarters of Fred and Dahl. On the afternoon of February 13, he arrived at the location of the Second Corps in Tibet. In accordance with Eisenhower's previous instructions, 
Fred and Doll was to keep a mobile reserve ready, covering it with a flank of reconnaissance and light units. Eisenhower found, however, that the American infantry occupied isolated heights along the front line, and the mobile reserves were scattered in small groups across the front. At dawn the next morning, German Tiger tanks broke through a pass at Fade, 60 kilometers south of Fondelk. Friedendahl's hopes of holding the passage dissipated already in the first hours of the offensive. The enemy, having broken through the dorsal in large forces, quickly surrounded and isolated the American units entrenched on the neighboring hills. The troops occupying the slopes on both sides of the passage were crushed, and Eisenhower lost all chance of stopping the enemy. In a counterattack by tanks into the enemy's flank smothered near Spitler, where dive bombers of the Germans attacked the American tanks. At Spatler, the road from Fider branched off. On road, 130 kilometers long, led north to British field depots in the Lee Kuf area. Another, 115 kilometers long, ran west toward the American depots at Tabessa. Either of these sites was tempting to the Germans. Anderson, learning of the German breakthrough of the front at Fade, ordered troops to withdraw to the west dorsal, running parallel to the east dorsal, on which the Allies had initially entrenched themselves. The West Dorsal had a narrow passage five kilometers wide, known as the Kasserine Passage, which gave access to a wide flat valley leading to Tabessa, and sophisticated in battle. The regimental commander dispersed his troops throughout the Kasserine Pass as if it were a matter of stopping a herd of cattle. The decisive mountain slopes on either side of the pass were left uncovered, and the Germans broke through them. The Allies, having dispersed their reserves with which they could have counterattacked, were now bringing battalion after battalion into the battle, and as soon as another battalion entered the battle, the Germans destroyed it. Only in the evening of February 21, 16 kilometers from Taylor, near the road to Besser, Le Kiff, the enemy tanks, were stopped. Further German offensive was delayed by tanks of the 6th British Panzer Division, transferred to the south and artillery of the 9th American Infantry Division, which, advancing around the clock on icy mountain roads, made a 1,200-kilometer march from Oran. Early on the morning of February 23, the enemy retreated through the Kasserine Pass, mined the escape routes with teller mines to discourage Allied pursuit. By this time, Montgomery had already approached the Merritt Line, and Rommel was forced to move his tanks to halt the Eighth Army's advance. The Germans could not hope to win the campaign in North Africa, but they had won a significant victory at the Kasserine Pass to prolong the war. That morning, as Rommel withdrew his tanks, an American C-54 aircraft, coming in from the South Atlantic, glided over the port city of Dakar on the coast of French North Africa and bounced along the uneven runway of a still-under-construction airbase. It was a cold, windy day, and the thin-legged Senegalese men hauling metal plates were shivering in their rags. I climbed out of the plane, stretching my stiff legs. We had arrived in Eisenhower's theater of operations, our plane was one of the first to arrive directly from Natal in Brazil to the still under construction Transportation Aviation Command base in Dakar. Prior to the opening of this line, aircraft in the South Atlantic had been routed via Ascension Island, where an intermediate airfield had been established, to the British base at Accra, 2100 kilometers south of Dakar. After a 25 cent breakfast of canned bacon and egg powder offered to us in a Toliet hut at the airfield in Dakar, we boarded the plane again to continue our journey north another 2250 kilometers to Marrakesh in French Morocco. The plane flew for hours over the lifeless Sahara, but as soon as we crossed the Moroccan border, the snowy peaks of the high Atlas rose steeply above the desert plain, and our onward journey continued between them. Beyond the mountain range, on the fertile northern slopes lay Marrakeek, like a crystal city in the center of a green oasis. From above, the white huge mosques of the city seemed like giant mushrooms to us. We landed here and spent the night at the Arabesque Mamounia Hotel. Early the next day we flew to Algeria in a C-47 cargo plane. Eisenhower's armoured Cadillac was already waiting for us at the hangars when, on the afternoon of February 24, 1943, raising fountains of water, we landed on a bomb-shattered airfield on the outskirts of Algiers. The armoured car had been made in England at the urging of intelligence officers who feared for Eisenhower's safety in the narrow crowded streets of Algiers. However, the tyres could not withstand the weight of the armoured body mounted on an ordinary car chassis, and the car was eventually turned over to transport important persons. Stepping off the metal plate runway, we dragged our luggage, stepping through impenetrable mud, 
and for the first time I understood Ike, who had complained to General Marshall about the mud that chained aviation to the ground. It had been years since we'd had such heavy rains here as we'd had this winter. They had turned North Africa into a quagmire in which even the steel plates delivered here to improve the airfields sank. Eisenhower's Allied headquarters was squeezed into the clumsy St. George Hotel. The hotel stood on a palm-covered hillside overlooking the busy harbour of Algiers. Liberty ships crowded the wharves where Arabs bustled about. The overcast sky was dotted with barrage balloons. The St. George Hotel, its mosaic-tiled corridors, was an African pentagon filled with finely dressed Allied officers. Like all headquarters, Allied headquarters grew menacingly after the landing in Algeria. It employed no less than 1,100 officers. Upon arrival at St. George Hotel, I was immediately ushered into Eisenhower's office. Next door was the office of his tireless chief of staff, Bedell Smith, so began my joint service with Dwight Eisenhower, which lasted throughout the war. For 28 years after graduating from West Point, we were moved from one garrison to another, but we never served together. In fact, we saw each other no more than six times, and that was only during Army and Navy sporting events and at rare traditional reunions. Eisenhower entered West Point on June 14, 1911, and graduated in 1915. In 1911, I was still working in the shops at the Wabash Railroad in Moberly, Missouri. My father, a country teacher, died when I was 14 years old. I lived on the means of my portly mother. Upon graduating from Moberly High School in 1910, I joined the railroad, expecting to save up money to attend university the following year. One Sunday evening in the late spring of 1911, John Cruzen, a real estate agent and Sunday school director at my parish church, asked why I should not enroll at West Point. He knew of my love of the outdoor life, inherited from my father who had taken me hunting when I was a child. Hey, I can't expect to get into West Point, I said, I'll have a hard enough time making a living as it is. You won't have to pay at West Point, Omar Cruzen explained. The army will pay for your tuition. This heightened my interest in a possible career as a soldier. No one I knew knew our congressman from Missouri's 2nd Congressional District, the Honorable W. Dobber, so I wrote him myself and asked him to recommend me for West Point. He replied that the primary candidate for West Point from our state had already been scheduled, but that he would be pleased to have me try my hand at the examinations as a reserve candidate. I had less than a week to prepare for the exams, and it had been almost a year since I had graduated from high school. I despaired of being able to enter, and so I did not quit my job at the railroad in order to be able to study during the day. At that time, I had just been promoted and transferred to the boiler shop where I was earning 17 cents an hour. Moreover, as I was to hold an examination in St. Louis, I did not want to waste money on a ticket for an apparently useless, as it seemed to me, trip. Despite this disappointment, I still went to my father's friend, school principal J. Lilly, for advice. Don't give up, Omar. It's worth a try, he urged me. Maybe the railroad will give you a free pass. If so, sir, I'll go. I got a free railroad ticket, and three weeks later I was notified that the principal candidate had failed in the examinations. I was ordered to report to West Point on August 1, 1911. During my three years at the school, I became friends with Eisenhower. We were in the same training company, and we played soccer together until Eisenhower sprained his knee and was dropped from the team. This injury was further compounded when Eisenhower failed to jump off a horse in the arena. During graduation, a medical board questioned Eisenhower's production as an officer, fearing that he would prove to be of limited fitness for military service. During the war, Major General Troy Middleton, commander of the 8th Corps, also suffered from arthritis of the knee. General Marshall was asked to remove him from command of the Corps and return him to the United States. I prefer, Marshall replied, to have a man with arthritis of the knee than with arthritis of the head. Leave Middleton in place? Fortunately, the graduation committee at West Point was equally sensitive to Eisenhower. My relationship with Bedell Smith was closer, though I knew him for less time. Zealous for his work, ardent and restless, he was in stark contrast to his polite superior. Smith had already established himself as a most valuable member of Eisenhower's staff. He had joined the National Guard at the age of 16. His knowledge went far beyond the military service and thus such an officer was of great help to Eisenhower in resolving the complex administrative and political issues that plagued the staff. In 1931, Bedell Smith, then only a captain, 
entered the infantry school at Fort Benning for advanced training. Smith proved himself to be an outstanding officer with a clear head, able to clearly assess the situation and articulate his thoughts. After he completed the one-year course, I asked Marshall to keep Smith at the school as one of the instructors. Just at that time, General Marshall was present in the classroom, where Smith read an abstract on his combat experience in World War Y. Smith's report was given to the class. General Marshall was greatly impressed by Smith's report, and he said to his adjutant, I want Smith to work here in the Secretariat. It is the best abstract I have heard in my life. I did not press my request, and Smith became the school's staff officer. Sitting in a chair in front of an operational map with a pointer in his hand, Eisenhower outlined my task. Hmm, so go to the front at once, he said, and study everything that I myself would like to find out if I had time. Bedel will give you a letter for Fredendol and others, stating that you are my representative. The defeat of the Americans at the Kasserine Pass had already caused concern in Algeria and questioned the competence of the American command, the quality of training and the conformity of our armament to modern requirements. However, Eisenhower was not looking for a scapegoat, because the errors at Kasserine all links of command were so numerous that they could not be attributed to the wrong actions of one person. Eisenhower emphasized that he wanted above all to learn from the defeat. If by this time Eisenhower had lost confidence in Fredendall as commander of the Second Corps, he was thoughtfully silent about it in his conversation with me. I had to draw my own conclusions and report them to him. Although I had no authority to act on Eisenhower's behalf, I was given the freedom to, as he put it, make suggestions for better utilization of American commanders at the front. I was in a rather uninviable position because many viewed me as Eisenhower's agent at the front, who would gather gossip and report it to his master over the head of the commanding officers. I soon became convinced that my mission did not enthuse the commander of the Second Corps. When Eisenhower asked if I was well equipped for long trips to the front, I thought bitterly of the 35 pounds of unnecessary jackets and light-coloured pants I had brought with me on the advice of my Washington friends. My bundle of bedding, a sleeping bag, an air mattress, and a waterproof LEL bean, bean cape, remained in port in Brooklyn awaiting transportation on some commodity passenger steamer. This was the last time during the war that I parted with my bedroll. On the first evening during dinner at Eisenhower's well-guarded villa near the St. George Hotel, Eisenhower's pleasant manners disappeared when he spoke angrily about the criticism in the United States of his deal with Darlan. As if trying to finally convince himself, he spoke hotly and at length about the circumstances that had forced this favourable deal with Vichy. Darlan's assassination on Christmas Eve had saved Eisenhower the trouble, yet the question still plagued him. Eisenhower had not at all made a mistake in going along with Darlan. He understood the political danger of the deal. He quickly understood the intricacies of his political position in North Africa. Before entering into negotiations with Darlan, he carefully weighed the military benefits of cooperation against the risk of embarrassing the Allies. Although public reaction to the deal was much sharper than Eisenhower had anticipated, he continued to hold the view that the compromise was critical to Allied security during the North African landings. Eisenhower argued that despite his unscrupulousness and bad reputation, Darlan had kept his promise and placed French North Africa in Allied hands. It was only Darlan's ceasefire order that ended French resistance to the Allied invasion. It was Darlan who persuaded the intractable Admiral Pierre Bosson in Dakar to link his fate with the Allies, thus securing for us a base in the South Atlantic in French West Africa. It is true that the French fleet at Toulon failed to leave and join the Allies, but it was scuttled and the Germans were unable to use it. Military necessity sometimes forces us to sacrifice principles. Collaboration with Darlon was no less abhorrent to Eisenhower than to his critics in the United States. Eisenhower maintained, however, that he was using Darlon not as an ally but as a convenient and useful tool for carrying out his plans. For two days I familiarized myself at Eisenhower's headquarters in Algeria with additional data regarding the situation at the front. In the crowded makeshift quarters of Allied headquarters, British and American personnel had already reached a unity that could be attributed to Eisenhower's insistence on cooperation between the Allies. No one will object, one officer explained to me, if you want to call someone a bastard. But if you call him an English bastard, then, sir, look out. X orders were clear. Squabblers who undermined unity were immediately sent back to their country on a common ship without guards. In establishing a common Allied headquarters, 
Eisenhower organized joint divisions, e-operations, intelligence, and supply planning. If a department was headed by a British officer, his deputy was an American, and vice versa. For supply and administration, however, it was necessary to establish parallel British and American bodies because of the peculiarities in the equipment and organization of the two armies. The British in the intelligence division of the Allied headquarters had their American counterparts under their belts. For many years before the war, the British had studied the world persistently, and this gave them advantages which we could never secure for ourselves. The American army had long underestimated the importance of intelligence training. This soon affected the leadership of our troops. In training officers for command posts, we have for many years neglected to give due attention to their intelligence training. It is completely unrealistic to assume that every officer has the aptitude and ability to command troops on the battlefield. Many are only suited for staff and intelligence work and would certainly choose to work in that specialty for life. Instead of selecting capable officers for intelligence work, however, we have put them through the usual troop training, making little use of their natural inclinations. Completely unsuitable men were often appointed to the intelligence organs. In some garrisons, the intelligence department even became the place where officers unfit for active service were rafted. I recall personally trying to get rid of my post when I was assigned to intelligence work. Had it not been for the exceptionally gifted men from the enlisted reservists who filled many of the intelligence posts during the war, our army would have been in dire need of a competent cadre of intelligence officers. On February 26, the day before I left for the Tunisian front, Algiers received reports that the Germans had launched a new offensive against the northern half of the Allied front. Once again, the enemy had chosen the direction to strike, taking into account the weakness of the Allies. While Alexander was regrouping his troops on the front to allocate scattered American units and direct them to the location of the Second Corps, Arnim hit the British positions in the north towards the centre of their communications in Bejaye, securely entrenched in east dorsal covering the coastal valleys. The enemy could hold off Montgomery to the south on the Merritt Line and at the same time use his troops near Tunis to launch a surprise attack on the Allies. The enemy not only did not give us the opportunity to close the ring of encirclement and combine our forces in the west with Montgomery's troops coming from the desert, but also tried to break us in pieces going into counterattacks on the weakly defended sections of our Western Front. Moreover, after the connection of the troops of Rommel and Arnim in Tunisia, the enemy was able to act on the internal operational lines. He could quickly move large contingents of troops from the front of the 8th Army to the front of the 1st Army. As long as the initiative was in the hands of the enemy, he continued to wear us down on both fronts. My authority as Eisenhower's representative on the Tunisian front was outlined in a short letter to all American commanders. Major General O.A. Bradley has come to your headquarters as the personal representative of the Commander of Troops in the North African Theatre of Operations to discuss matters of interest to you concerning American troops under your command. You will be kind enough to give him encouragement and assistance. Bedell Smith wanted to break away for a few days from the desk in Algiers, at which he had been going through so much trouble and volunteered to escort me to the location of the Second Corps. We flew to Constantine in Eisenhower's B-17 armed bomber, and Hansen and Bridge arrived after us in jeeps. Constantine was a natural fortress surrounded on three sides by a gorge, several times deeper than Niagara's. It housed the headquarters of the Army and Air Force commands. In the headquarters of the ground forces of Alexander worked mostly British. From the Americans were only a few liaison officers. The clothing of British staff officers who had been in combat for the most part in the desert was a set of picturesque and extremely varied uniforms. Sweaters, pleather pants and jackets replaced the standard British field uniforms worn by First Army personnel. Many officers were bundled up in smelly sheepskin burkas. I was told that this clothing was very practical as the temperature drops dramatically at night in the desert. The officers at the headquarters of Alexander's Army Group behaved calmly and at ease like people long ago accustomed to the inconveniences of war. In 1940, when I was only a lieutenant colonel and serving in Washington, Alexander had already commanded a division in the evacuation of British troops from Dunkirk. He was then transferred to Burma, where he also had to retreat. Thus, for three years, the Axis troops had beaten him at opposite ends of the globe. Alexander was now enjoying the role reversal that resulted from the numerical superiority of the Allies on the front in Tunisia, 
a patient, prudent, and fair soldier, Alexander, more than anyone else, helped American commanders mature on the battlefield and finally grow during the Tunisian campaign. His primary task was to build synergy on the Allied front, the fulfillment of this task, not to mention Alexander's great commanding skill, tact and diplomacy, required him to be tolerant and cautious. Among the British officers I know, no one had these qualities in greater measure than General Alexander. During the Casablanca Conference in January 1943, Allied planners envisioned the need for a unified command for Alexander's and Eisenhower's forces in the final phase of the fighting in North Africa. Under this plan, Alexander's forces were to come under the command of Allied headquarters on the day that Montgomery's 8th Army crossed the border into Tunisia. Alexander was becoming Ike's deputy for ground forces. This occurred on February 20, but Alexander became not only Deputy Supreme Allied Commander, but also Commander of the 18th Army Group. The group consisted of Anderson's 1st Army, Montgomery's 8th Army, Fredendal's 2nd American Corps, and the French 19th Corps under Jouin. The 18th Army Group received its number from the 1st and 8th Armies that had joined it. It was given the primary task of taking Tunisia in a pincer, trapping the Axis forces in their coastal corridor, and then pushing northward to trap and destroy them. As soon as Alexander deployed his Army Group Command Center at Constantine, Anderson was relieved of command of the West Tunisian Front, but retained command of the First Army. Both the French and American corps withdrew from Anderson's command and came under the direct control of Alexander's Army Group headquarters. Alexander above all put an end to the haphazard movement of troops on Anderson's front. The troops of each country were concentrated in a certain area, and they were given full responsibility for the defense of their sector of the front. For the first time on the southern section of the front in Tunisia, Fredendall felt himself a corps commander in both substance and form. The scattered tank battalions of the 1st Armored Division were brought together. For the first time since the landing at Oran, the 1st Infantry Division was able to pull its three regiments together in a fist. Simultaneously with the regrouping of ground forces, Eisenhower, through his deputies, consolidated the leadership of the air and naval forces stationed in the Mediterranean Basin. On February 19, he established an Air Force command in the Mediterranean Sea, headed by Air Chief Marshal Arthur Tedder. Tedder's new command extended Eisenhower's control to all Allied air forces, British, French, and American, stationed in Northwest Africa, the Middle East, and Malta. Major General Carl Speyatz, an outwardly calm man and an excellent pilot, was appointed commander of the Air Force in Northwest Africa. Spatz was subordinate to Major General James Dolittle, commander of the Strategic Air Force, Air Marshal Arthur Cunningham, commander of the Tactical Air Force, and Air Marshal Hugh Lloyd, commander of the Coastal Defense Air Force. Dolittle's heavy and medium bombers were to destroy strategic facilities and enemy naval bases, prevent German air power from using bases in Tunisia, and strike enemy communications. On Koningerma, Tedder assigned the task of providing direct air support for ground troops. The need for such support was keenly felt at the front, where even outdated and clumsy U-87 attacked Allied ground troops, not too afraid of our aviation. Fleet Admiral Andrew Cunningham was appointed commander of naval forces in the Mediterranean. Thus, when I arrived at Eisenhower's office on February 24, his headquarters controlled the entire Mediterranean Sea from Casablanca to the Middle East. Eisenhower was not only ready to knock the Germans out of Africa, but was already hard at work planning the landing of Allied troops in Sicily. Bedell and I left Constantine for the front in a 1939 Ford car requisitioned by the Allies shortly after the landings. The well-paved Algerian highway was filled with trucks moving from Constantine to Tabessa. Arabs in homespun burkas selling eggs were seen on the sides of the highway. As the number of troops moving to the front increased, so did the price of fresh eggs. These ragged petty traders were earning more at that time than they would have gotten in a lifetime of farming. Halfway to Tabessa we moved, at Smith's suggestion, from our closed ford to an open jeep, from which we could more easily jump out in the event of an assault raid. Two armoured personnel carriers with 12.7mm machine guns escorted the jeep. The increased security made me laugh until Bedell Smith explained that only a week before, one of the men travelling with him had been killed in an enemy air raid. From that time on, we took the usual precautions in our jeep rides through Tunisia. One of us sitting in the car watched the air in front and the other in the back. The windshield was rolled back and covered to avoid reflecting the sun's rays. 
and the tarpaulin top was rolled up and buttoned, in the winter of 1943, despite the increased power of the Allied air forces. The German air force operated almost unimpeded on the Tunisian front. The sound of an airplane engine was the signal to stop and take cover near the road. The Second Corps' headquarters was stationed in the small town of Jebel Kuif, a phosphate mining area 24 kilometers north of the walled city of Tebissa. Corps troops rested in the wooded part of Dorsal behind a ridge of hills that covered their rear. As a result of the regrouping of the troops of the front, conducted by Alexander, the Second Corps now consisted of four divisions, reinforced by a sufficient number of artillery, anti-tank and anti-aircraft divisions. The corps consisted of Major General Orlando Ward's newly concentrated 1st Armoured Division, Major General Terry de la Mesa Allen's 1st Infantry Division, Major General Charles Ryder's 34th Infantry Division, and Major General Manton Eddy's newly arrived 9th Infantry Division. While planning the SFAX offensive, large supplies were concentrated at Tebessa. When the offensive was cancelled, these supplies were transferred to the 2nd Corps. Meanwhile, new tanks, trucks, half-treks and self-propelled anti-tank guns were being sent to the front daily to make up for losses at the Kassirin Pass. Many of these tanks were hastily withdrawn from the 2nd Armoured Division guarding the remote border with Spanish Morocco. At first, the head of the rear of the 1st Army Anderson believed that the available means of transportation. He could provide supplies on the southern section of the Tunisian front troops numbering 38,000 people. However, this did not take into account the ingenuity of the American railroaders and the amazing ability of the Americans to supply in the field entire armies only with the help of vehicles. To compensate for American losses and quickly bring the Second Corps to the state of readiness, Eisenhower urgently ordered to deliver an additional 5.4 thousand trucks from the United States. Thus, instead of 38,000, which the British considered the maximum on the site of the Second Corps, we ended up fielding 92,000 men and provided them with supplies during the offensive. The tendency of the British to underestimate the capabilities of the Americans with regard to the organization of rear guard service created great difficulties during further actions in Tunisia. For when moving troops to a particular section of the front, the army must take into account the possibility of supplying the available roads and railroads. Thus, rear area issues became a decisive factor in the development of any tactical plan. Later in the war, I often explained to my staff that the intelligence department exists to tell me what to do on the basis of information received about the enemy. The logistics department informs me of our supply capabilities. When I made a decision, the operations department would formalize it in the form of an order. In this way, a sluggish logistics chief could limit the commander's vision. At the same time, an energetic logistics officer could help implement a broader plan of action. Fortunately, my logistics chiefs were always resourceful. The Second Corps command post was housed in an abandoned and unheated French school in Jebel Kuif. The building was long ago without furniture or plumbing. Everything had been cleared away by the Arabs who lived in the neighborhood. Here at Corp headquarters, the Anglo-American friendship so highly valued in Algeria showed signs of discord after the defeat at Kassirin Pass. The Second Corps still felt the acute pain of defeat and openly blamed Anderson for the dispersal of forces that had failed to halt the German advance. Anderson had moved American troops to the English and French sections of the front and thus deprived the Second Corps of the mobile reserves it had hoped to use for a counterattack. Although the Americans feared that the Second Corps would become a scapegoat for Anderson's mistakes, the Corps' headquarters was not at all pessimistic about the situation on the front. Material losses had not yet been fully recovered, and Corps' headquarters was planning an offensive to recapture East Dorsal. Anson, Bridge and I were given one room in a dirty mining company hotel, but I left immediately with Bedel from Jebel Kuif for the 1st Armoured Division. In visiting this and other divisions, I hoped to glean useful information that might help us in our combat training of troops in the United States. Ward concentrated his badly thinning 1st Armoured Division in the Tebessa area, where stunted southern pines sheltered the rocky steeps of the western dorsal. During the battle for Tunisia in December and during the German breakthrough at Faye, the division suffered heavy losses in material. Only at the Fade Pass, more than 90 tanks were burned. The remaining tanks were heavily covered with mud for camouflage purposes. At each bivouac, crews tended to the vehicles, bringing them to combat readiness. Ward was pleased that his division was finally assembled. 
For four months, units of the 1st Armoured Division fought in isolation from each other, supporting either British, French or American troops. The 1st Armoured Division had never been in full force, and Ward wanted to show what an American Armoured Division could do if given a manageable task and well stocked with supplies. For two days I was in the bivouac area of the division, talking to officers and NC asking what they had learned in the first weeks of fighting. They recognised that the enemy was a nimble and clever opponent, but they attributed most of their defeats to lack of combat experience. If the Americans often rushed into the attack headlong, the Germans, on the contrary, carefully scouted ways of approach, skillfully used the beds of dried rivers and ravines to cover the troops and provide camouflage offensive. At first, our tankers rushed into the attack like cavalrymen, recklessly relying on the speed of vehicles and the thickness of armour. Unfortunately, this did not help them as soon as they were in range of German anti-tank artillery. Checking the compliance of the equipment to the requirements of the battle, I found out that our tanks Sherman with a gasoline engine had already gained notoriety among American troops at the front. When a shell hit the engine, the high-octane gasoline easily caught fire. Crews requested diesel engines to keep the tanks from catching fire. A hardened young veteran, Sergeant James Bowser, 23, approached me on behalf of the crew. General, he said, this is my third tank, although the crew is the same. We barely had time to jump out of the previous two vehicles. If the tanks had diesel engines, this would not have happened. Gasoline engines burst into flames on the first or second hit. Then all we have to do is jump out of the burning vehicle, leaving it to burn. I found out that the combat qualities of the half-tracked vehicle were also highly overrated. It was not a bad vehicle for transporting soldiers in off-road conditions, but it could not serve as a good defence against enemy fire. When I asked one soldier if a machine gun could penetrate the light armour of this vehicle, he looked at me and grinned. No, sir, he said, not through and through. The bullets come in from one side only. Make a little noise, and that's it. In fact, American half-tracks were comfortable and reliable vehicles. The bad reputation arose because inexperienced American troops tried to use them improperly. Already at the very beginning of the war, the German 88mm gun became a menace to infantry and tanks. This gun, with a high muzzle velocity of the projectile, designed to fight tanks and airplanes, had already demonstrated its capabilities as an anti-tank weapon. The German gun easily emerged victorious against our Sherman tanks, armed with 75mm guns. In the first battle, American tankers learned that their General Grant and Sherman tanks could not compete with the better armed German tanks, which had thicker armour. Even two years later during the Battle of the Ardennes, this gap had not yet been eliminated. Although the Sherman was later armed with a larger calibre gun, it could never fight one-on-one -on -one with German Panther and Tiger tanks. However, in terms of reliability, American tanks far surpassed German tanks. Their powerful engines could always be... This advantage, as well as superiority in numbers, gave us the opportunity to surround the Germans and hit their tanks from the flank. Our willingness to sacrifice Shermans was, however, little consolation for the crews forced to go into battle on these tanks. If the enemy perfectly realised the interaction between tanks and dive bombers, the requests of American tankers for air support, for the most part, went unanswered. Air and Ground Force headquarters had not yet simplified the complicated system of responding to requests for air support, and often the planes appeared when the enemy was already gone. I tried not to touch the question of command, but in the first week at the front, it became clear to me that Fredendall no longer enjoyed the confidence of his division commanders. Ward could not forgive Fredendall for his subservience to Anderson, which resulted in the 1st Armoured Division being scattered all over the front. Ryder, commander of the 34th Division, was equally critical of the corps commander. He had lost the best units of one of his regiments at the Kasserine Pass as a result of improper troop disposition. Deprived of authority, Friedendahl found himself in an intolerable position. The blame for the defeat at Kasserine could not, of course, be laid on him alone, but he was too compromised in the eyes of his subordinates. Henceforth he could not properly command them. It was clear to me that Fredendall should be removed, but I did not inform Eisenhower about it. Fredendall's headquarters at Jebel Kuif had been loyal to his corps commander. But confidence was shattered, and although the corps was inclined to lay the blame for the difficulties on the British First Army, this made the situation more difficult rather than easier. Meanwhile, the British were eagerly awaiting the Second Corps to take the offensive again. 
There was also a growing belief in Algiers that the defeat at Kasserine had undermined the offensive spirit of the Second Corps, that the American command had become too cautious and overly cautious. Eisenhower, alarmed by reports of a drop in morale among Second Corps personnel, visited Tebessa on March 5. Although Alexander as commander of the army group was already engaged in reorganizing the entire Tunisian front, the Second Corps was still under the command of Anderson's First Army. Eisenhower proposed that both French and American corps be subordinated directly to Alexander on an equal footing with Anderson's army. Fred Endel did not inform me of Eisenhower's arrival at the corps. I learned of it only after I received a call from the 9th Division, where I was stationed, asking me to come to Tebessa. During break in the meeting, Eisenhower asked me to come out onto the veranda of the small plastered European cabin in which we were gathered. What do you think of the commander here? he asked. Hmm, pretty bad, I replied. I've talked to all the division commanders. They've all lost confidence in Fred and Doll as a corps commander. Hmm, thank you, Brad, said Eisenhower. You've confirmed exactly what I doubted. I've already called Patton from Rabat. He would arrive tomorrow and take command of the Second Corps. The news of Patton's arrival made it seem as if a bomb had exploded over Jebel Kuiv. 